You're listening to The Data Podcast, where we explore all things data. Okay, so if you're a leader in almost any organization today, chances are you're feeling this, this kind of weird thing we call the data paradox. You know, you're practically swimming in data, right? Terabytes, petabytes coming in every day, customer stuff, operations, market trends. But then you ask a really basic critical question like, hey, what's our real customer acquisition cost? Or where's the hidden risk maybe in our supply chain? And suddenly the answers are slow or they contradict each other. Or maybe you just you just can't trust them. That's it exactly. That's the paradox right there. Companies have poured, I mean, billions into just collecting data, storing it. Yeah. Massive capability. But they're starving. Starving for you know real trustworthy insights that actually help them make better decisions. So our mission today really is to cut through some of the noise, the hype around the latest tools, the data lakes, the AI. This is meant to be a practical deep dive. How do you actually build a true data strategy? One that's uh, relentlessly focused on business value, not just the tech itself. Yeah, we really need to unpack that right away because that confusion mixing up tech spending with actual strategic thinking, I think that's where so much goes wrong. A lot of leaders, they just treat data strategy like, well, like an IT upgrade. But you mentioned a strategy test. What are the key questions a real business-focused data strategy has to answer? Right. It has to lift the conversation way beyond just servers and databases. Um, the first question is fundamental. What data do we absolutely need? We need to drive our most critical business decisions, not just everything we could collect, but what's truly essential for those big, high-value outcomes. Okay, so that sounds like ruthless prioritization. You can't boil the ocean, basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. Then the, the second question follows. How do we make sure this essential data is consistently trustworthy and secure and compliant? This is where governance, data quality, together. these become executive level priorities. They're not just tech tasks delegated way down the chain. Got it. Non-negotiable. What's third? Third, how are we going to extract measurable value from this data? You've got to def define clear, quantifiable use cases. You might start simple, maybe just better reporting, but you need a path toward more advanced stuff like AI eventually. Makes sense. And the last one. And finally, number four, and this is the one that honestly often gets overlooked. How do we build the capabilities? I mean, the people, the skills, the culture, the whole organizational setup needed to actually sustain this new way of operating driven by data. That framework really helps clarify things immediately. It separates the, uh, the strategic from just the technical. But OK, let's flip it. What happens if we ignore those four questions? What's the actual like dollar cost of flying blind here? Oh, the costs are huge and often hidden, buried in operational waste or um, compliance penalties. Study after study, they consistently show that just poor data quality alone costs companies. Well, on average, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of their annual revenue. Hold on. 15 to 25 percent. So if you're running, say, a, a billion dollar company, you're saying up to a quarter billion dollars could just be evaporating simply because you can't trust your own numbers. That's, wow, that's a huge indictment. It's very real, and it's measurable when you look closely. Think about some real-world examples we've seen. There was a major national retailer, right? For years, they calculated inventory turnover using three completely different definitions across their different divisions. Oh. Yeah, the result, millions, literally millions, in misallocated capital. Because fundamentally, they couldn't even agree on what they were measuring. It was a structural failure. Or uh, in healthcare, mm -hmm. one provider discovered patient records were fragmented across 17 separate legacy systems. 17. 17 systems for one patient's record. Mm -hmm. That's not just inefficient. It's, it directly impacts the quality of care. And imagine the compliance nightmare, the risk involved there. Yeah, those examples make that abstract cost feel very, very real, painfully real. Which brings us back to that fork in the road you mentioned. Technology first, or strategy first. You had that great story, that anecdote about two companies. Yes, the classic illustration of this strategic choice. So, Company A, they did what many companies do, followed the sort of common wisdom, mm -hmm. invested big, about $20 million in a brand new state-of-the-art data lake, bought powerful cloud tools, hired a very expensive team of data scientists. Sounds like the standard playbook, right? Pretty much. Yeah. But three years later, what do they have? Well, petabytes of data, sure. Yeah. But it was messy, untrusted, poorly cataloged. Nobody in the actual business lines was using it. And that data science team, they lacked clear direction. The data wasn't clean. Eventually, they just got frustrated and left. So a $20 million investment that basically just sat there gathering digital dust. Expensive shelfware. That's exactly it. They confused building a platform, the mm -hmm. technology, 
with actually delivering business outcomes. Mm. Now, Company B took the complete opposite approach. They started really small, laser focused on just one high value business problem. Yeah. Speeding up insurance claims processing. Okay, much narrower focus. Much narrower. They didn't build a giant data lake. They cleaned and unified only the data they needed for that single use case. Yeah. They deployed relatively simple predictive analytics to help the adjusters prioritize. And the result, within nine months, they dropped claims processing time by 30%. 30%? Wow. Huge impact. And they built momentum from there. So the critical difference wasn't the budget, was it? It was the strategy, starting with a, a clear problem, proving value, and then building out. And that kind of success, that incremental build, it needs a structure. Which leads us nicely into what you call the five pillars, the supports for a data strategy that actually lasts. That's right. If you look at organizations that are really succeeding with data over the long haul, their strategies tend to stand on five interconnected pillars. To think of it like legs on a table. You need data governance and quality. You need the right architecture and infrastructure, analytics and insights, people and culture, and finally, use cases and value realization. If one is weak, the whole thing wobbles. Okay, let's dig into those. Pillar one. Data governance and quality. You mentioned this earlier. But honestly, for a lot of people listening, governance still probably sounds like, you know, red tape, bureaucracy, the Department of No. How do we flip that perception? We have to redefine it. It's not the brakes. It's the operating system that actually enables speed and safety. Good governance clarifies things. Who's accountable for what piece of data? Who gets to see what? How do we fix it when the numbers don't match up? And the absolute core part of this is clear accountability. Every critical data element your customer ID, your official revenue number, your inventory account, it needs an owner, a data steward. An owner, okay. And critically, this is really important. These stewards need to be business leaders, not IT folks who happen to manage the database underneath. Mm -hmm. It's about business meaning and use. That makes sense conceptually. But who actually signs off on data quality then? Doesn't that create a massive bottleneck in practice if every piece of data needs a business leader stamp? Ah, good question. It can be a bottleneck if you try to centralize it all or boil the ocean. The steward owns the definition and the rules. Mm. But the measurement of quality, that has to be automated, continuous. You define the key dimensions, things like accuracy, completeness, consistency, timeliness, validity, and you measure them constantly. But here's the key. You only focus intense measurement and remediation on the data that's critical for your current high priority use cases. Ah, okay, so it's targeted. Measure what matters for the problem you're solving now. That avoids the bottleneck. Exactly. It builds credibility step by step, one critical data set at a time. Okay, that helps position governance much better. Now, before we get to the, let's be honest, the fun stuff like AI and analytics, we need the foundation. Pillar two, architecture and infrastructure. We're not just talking about choosing cloud vendor A versus cloud vendor B here, are we? No, definitely not. That's a tactical choice. Ooh. The strategic question for architecture isn't about the vendor label. It's, yeah. is our data accessible? Is it unified? Can different systems talk to each other? Is it interoperable? The architecture's job is to break down silos. Remember that healthcare provider with 17 systems for patient data? Yeah, horrifying. That's an architectural failure, plain and simple. A strategic architecture makes sure the right people can easily get to the right data when they need it. It supports the business need. It doesn't dictate it. Right. The goal is access and usability, not just storage. Okay, strategic architecture handled. Let's move to pillar three, analytics and insights. This is where we see companies often jump the gun, right? They go straight out and buy some fancy AI tool hoping for magic. That's often that $20 million mistake we talked about earlier. You really have to climb the maturity curve first. It's a journey. Analytics, broadly speaking, exists in four stages, and you need a solid foundation at each level before you can really succeed at the next. Stage one is just mastering descriptive analytics, answering the basic question, what happened? This is your standard reporting, your KPIs, your dashboards. The basics. The absolute basics. And honestly, if people in your organization don't trust these basic numbers, they will never trust a complex machine learning forecast coming out of some black box. Makes total sense. Get the reporting right before you try predicting the future. Okay, so after descriptive, what's next? Next up is diagnostic analytics. This is about figuring out why did it happen? So root cause analysis, understanding correlations, digging into the context behind the numbers. Once those first two stages are really solid, then you can start moving effectively into the more advanced stuff. Stage three is predictive analytics. What will happen? 
This is where machine learning comes in for things like forecasting sales, predicting customer churn, anticipating maintenance needs. Okay, that's where a lot of the excitement is. It is, but it rests on the previous stages. Yeah. And then finally, the pinnacle, stage four, is prescriptive analytics. What should we do about it? This is where you start automating decisions, optimizing processes in real time. They got dynamic pricing engines or automated routing systems. Got it. So descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive. But if that descriptive foundation, those basic reports are shaky. Then the predictive and prescriptive insights are just, well, garbage in, garbage out. Expensive garbage, usually. Right. And making that climb, especially to the predictive and prescriptive stages, it feels like it requires a huge cultural shift, not just better tools. Absolutely. Which brings us directly to pillar four, people and culture. Because ultimately, the technology itself doesn't create value. It's the people using the data to make smarter, faster decisions who create the value. And this is notoriously the hardest part, isn't it? You're often fighting against years of gut feel decisions, intuition, organizational politics, hierarchy. How do you actually build a culture that values, as you put it, curiosity over certainty? It starts by actively working to eliminate the HPO. The PPO. The highest paid person's opinion. In a data-driven culture, disagreements get resolved through analysis, through evidence, not just based on who has the bigger office or the fancier title. And that transition is tough. It's really difficult because, frankly, people can feel vulnerable when their long-held beliefs or their gut instincts are challenged by a chart or a metric. So how do leaders drive that? How do they model that behavior consistently without making it seem like they're undermining their own experience or authority? It can't just be a memo from HR saying, use data now. No, definitely not. It requires real, consistent behavioral change, starting right at the top. The single most effective tactic I've seen is simple but powerful. Leaders must consistently, relentlessly ask in every important meeting, every strategic review, what data supports this recommendation? Show me the numbers. Yeah. We saw one CEO implement this. He basically just refused to discuss any major proposal unless the supporting data, usually a dashboard, was presented right alongside it. Wow. Just that one question asked consistently. Overnight, it shifted the entire dynamic in leadership meetings. It went from people advocating for their pet projects to people collaborating to understand the evidence. It reframes the whole conversation. That's powerful. From advocacy to inquiry and that need for evidence for trustworthy data, it absolutely has to extend into the ethical site too, especially as we get into more advanced AI and machine learning. Oh, 100%. This is critical. When you start building models based on historical data, especially data about people, you risk inheriting and amplifying historical biases. The Amazon AI recruiting tool incident is probably the most famous and frankly kind of alarming example of this. Right. Remind us what happened there. Well, they trained an AI model to screen resumes using about 10 years of their own hiring data as the input. The problem was, historically, the tech industry and likely Amazon's own hiring pool skewed male. So the AI essentially learned that male candidates were preferable. It started penalizing resumes that included the word women's, like women's chess club captain, and downgrading graduates from all women colleges. That's incredibly problematic. They had to scrap the whole tool, didn't they? They did. It's a stark lesson. Historical data often encodes historical injustice. And if you're not careful, your algorithms will just learn and perpetuate those biases. So how do you govern against that? How do you prevent your AI from learning bad habits, essentially? Your data governance framework must explicitly include ethics. It can't be an afterthought. Mm -hmm. You need to embed privacy by design, ethics by design, right from the start. Think about how you collect and use data. For example, we worked with a health tech company. They realized they didn't actually need to pull every single piece of granular patient data into a central cloud. Instead, they shifted a lot of the analysis to run directly on the local devices people were using. They only transmitted aggregated, anonymized data or specific alerts when an actual issue was detected. Ah, uh, so minimizing the data footprint. Exactly. It dramatically reduced the privacy risk, the data exposure, but still provided the clinical value they needed. It's about being intentional in the design to manage these inherent risks. That intentionality, both in design and in culture, leads us right to the final critical piece, connecting all this effort back to pillar five, which is use cases and value realization. Because, let's face it, all the governance, the slick architecture, the data-curious culture, it only matters if it actually translates into tangible results for the business. You absolutely have to speak the language of the business, the language of the C-suite. Too often, data folks, tech folks, we talk in our own jargon. We say things like, we need a faster data pipeline, or we need to modernize our cloud data warehouse. 
And frankly, those phrases just get blank stares in the boardroom. Right, it sounds like cost, not value. Precisely. But if you walk into that same room and say, we have identified a way to reduce our inventory carrying costs by 15% while actually improving our customer service levels. That gets attention, that gets budget. Uh, Every single data initiative in your strategic plan has to be framed in terms of clear business outcomes, growing revenue, cutting costs, or reducing risk. And delivering those outcomes requires more than just good intentions. You can't just throw money at it and hope. You need a structured plan, a roadmap. Mm -hmm. You mentioned thinking in horizons. Yes, the planning needs to be focused, but also adaptable. We find it helpful to think in terms of horizons. Horizon one, that's usually the first, say, zero to six months. The absolute focus here has to be on building the foundation and delivering some quick wins. You must deliver tangible, visible value early on. Maybe it's just finally getting a trusted sales dashboard out there, something yeah. concrete to build credibility across the organization. If you fail to deliver value in horizon one, the whole strategy often stalls out. So that initial trust, that early win, it's like the currency you need to fund the bigger bets later on. Makes sense. What about the next horizon? Horizon two, typically looking out, say, six to 18 months, that's where you start to scale up. You take those initial successful use cases and expand them. And you simultaneously work on maturing the underlying capabilities, strengthening your governance processes, building out the architecture, deepening the data skills and culture. It's also important briefly to think about how resources get balanced. While analytics and insights, the value creation part should probably get the largest share, maybe 30, 35% of the effort. You can't neglect the others. Governance, culture, architecture, they all need sustained, meaningful investment, typically somewhere in the 15 to 30% range each. This isn't a one-off project. It's building lasting capability. Right. It's a continuous effort across all pillars, yeah. not just a sprint on analytics. Okay. So if we're talking about measuring success at the end of the day, it can't just be about outputs like we built 10 new dashboards or we migrated to the cloud. It has to be about those business outcomes. Precisely. It has to come back to ROI, return on investment. I'm going to give you one more quick example. A large telecommunications company, they implemented a churn prediction model. The project cost about $4 million to build and deploy, but they didn't just track model accuracy. They tracked the actual retention rate improvement for the high-risk customers who received specific targeted interventions based on the model's output. And they could demonstrate, credibly, $30 million in retained annual revenue directly linked to that $4 million investment. $30 million retained from a $4 million spend. Now that's speaking the language of the C-suite. Exactly. That kind of concrete audited ROI is what justifies continuing and expanding the data strategy. It's far more powerful than any purely technical metric could ever be. That telco example really nails it, doesn't it? The difference between just building tech and actually executing a value-driven strategy. So looking back at our conversation today, the key takeaways seem clear. Avoid that technology first trap. Really master those five pillars, governance, architecture, analytics, people, and culture, and connecting it all to value. And maybe most importantly, treat that culture piece not as a soft issue, but as the absolute core challenge to get right. Couldn't agree more. And maybe one final thought, sustainability. A data strategy isn't something you create once and put on a shelf. It's a living thing. Mm. Your governance rules, your ethical standards, they have to evolve constantly as the business changes, as technology like generative AI changes the landscape. It demands continuous building of organizational capability, not just a one-time deployment. Which leaves us with a final, maybe provocative thought for you, our listener, to mull over. If long-term success really hinges on building these sustainable capabilities across all five pillars, which single capability in your organization, maybe governance, maybe culture, maybe architecture, needs the most urgent attention? What capability do you need to lift from, say, level two, where it's repeatable but maybe inconsistent, up to level three, where it's defined and standardized across the business? What's the one thing you need to tackle in the next six months to make sure your data investments stop becoming expensive digital shelfware? Something important to chew on until our next deep dive. 